All righty. Well, it is 12 o'clock. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Gardening in the Panhandle Live. Uh, it is March. The weather is beautiful outside. You know, we're up around 80 today here in Bluntstown. Um, people are getting the garden fever. I know I certainly am. I've been out in it uh, over the weekend and a little bit this week. Um, again, what better time to talk gardening? And we've got a great panel here today to answer uh, all of your burning questions. Um, let's get to know them a little bit before we get started. So our panelists today, as I call on y'all, tell us a little bit about yourself. So first on my screen, we've got Miss Sheila Dunning. Good afternoon, Sheila. Hi, I'm over here in Okaloosa County. So if you're familiar with the Crestview to Destin area, that's me. Um, and the farmland, of course, is up there in Baker and Laurel Hill. Uh, but I'm the commercial horticulture agent here. Awesome. And to your, to my right next is Mr. Matt Lawler. Good afternoon, Matt. Hey, Daniel. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Matt Lawler. I'm the horticulture or commercial horticulture agent here in Santa Rosa County. Awesome. And Molly Jamison. Hey, Molly. Hi there. I'm the sustainable agriculture and community food systems agent here in Leon County in Tallahassee. Um, love to talk about vegetable gardening, compost, all that good stuff. Yeah, Molly's the compost queen over there in Tallahassee. So, and our, our newcomer today, the new face is Dr. Josh Freeman. Hey, Josh. Hey, uh, so my name is Josh Freeman. Uh, I'm a vegetable uh, research and extension specialist located at North Florida Research and Education Center in Quincy. And I've got pretty much statewide responsibility, but most of my work is probably from Gainesville, Gainesville up through the Panhandle. Awesome. So hope you guys enjoy our show today. We've got a bunch of questions that y'all submitted, so we can't wait to get to them. Before we get going, uh, just a quick note at the top, don't forget when we get closer to the end to fill out our survey, you'll be able to find that in the chat and it'll be emailed to you um, after the end of the program today. So let's go ahead and get into it. So we're gonna start um, on the topic that is, is probably near and dear to everybody's heart right now, that, that especially if you're not, if you're a new gardener and that's, uh, is it too late to start vegetable seeds? And Molly, we're gonna start with you on that one. Is it too late? Can you still get them going? Oh, no, no, it's definitely not too late. Um, this is, so our, our average last spring, our frost date is March 15th. And so after that date is when all the warm loving crops uh, really wanna get into the ground. The soil will start heating up uh, so we can start planting our beans, our cucumbers, um, okra a little bit later as the soil warms up. Um, same with melons, uh, southern peas, uh, winter and summer squash. Uh, I would say the only things you don't want to do is you don't want to seed something like your tomatoes right now because uh, you're a little bit late, but you can get some transplants for tomatoes. So this is the time. This is when everything, all the action starts happening now. Yeah, so I know that last year I got a little bit of an early start, got an early jump on it. And I'm not sure how much ground I gained because my, I set out some transplants and they just kind of sat there. So you notice that happening from time to time? Well, yeah, especially if, you know, if it's a swarm loving crop, we've still had some pretty cool days, you know? Yeah. So if you look at the forecast, um, like, I, like you mentioned, we're getting up to around 80 now. So as the, as the weather heats up, a lot of those crops will really start taking off. Good deal. All right, we're going to move to Sheila. Sheila, kind of along those same lines, just maybe get into a little bit more detail. Um, what would you be looking to plant right now uh, in your garden over there in Crestview? And and Molly covered the the top ones there as far as uh, your your beans and your tomatoes and uh, peppers, eggplant, as well as start looking at your uh, squash and cantaloupes, watermelons, those type of things as we warm up. Um, additionally, the the okra. But I definitely encourage you to go to the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. If you don't already have that one, um, certainly um, it'll be added to the chat. It's, it's an, a website that UF, uh, through our EDIS system, and it gives you a really good chart of the months and the particular species. So if you are looking at, you know, when should I get started on something, use that as your reference um, because it will give you the specific months. But yeah, we are ending with our cool season stuff. It's a little late to be thinking about the leafy and the rooty crops. All right. You know, radishes, they're, they're pretty forgiving. You could get a quick crop of radishes if you wanted. But otherwise, 
let the lettuce go, wait till the fall. That's sad. Yeah, my lettuce is starting to, to bolt and be done. Yep. <laughs> but, but along those lines, Josh, we had a, a listener uh, from our, our Zoom questions here that wants to know, you know, to get a, to, to eat that season out a little bit, is there a carrot variety that will do well if you plant in March? So I'll get a late start to it. Can they still do something like that? I mean, you could, but I would certainly not recommend it. I mean, okay. carrots – really need to be overwintered uh, in an ideal situation. You, you know, see them last fall and they'd be coming off soon. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times also, if you grow carrots through the heat, um, they tend to crack and they also accumulate some, some odd, not odd, but generally unpleasant tastes. Oh, okay. uh, I mean, so usually when you get a bag of carrots, you know, if they came out of some hot, you know, some less than ideal environments, just because they tend to get that uh, more bitterness than what you would want. So now I would, I would wait for wait for the fall season to seed carrots, and so that that cold period helps preserve fla- enhance flavor. Or- no, it's just they they grow. Uh, I mean, they go a bit dormant. Uh, you'd seed them in the fall, and they're going right. to grow a little bit, get established. They're going to get dormant, uh, somewhat dormant, as dormant as we get in North Florida. I mean, that's a, the oddity for a few crops is they don't we don't really truly go into a dormancy. Mm-hmm. But they'll grow uh, very slowly, and then they'll take off rapidly. And uh, you should be digging them. Uh, my guess is you could probably start, I mean, obviously dig carrots anytime you want, but to, yeah. to get to full size, you'd probably be digging them in, you know, end of this month, sometime middle of next month would be my guess is when you want to be bringing them out of the ground. Yeah, I know. I've, I grow carrots in containers and I've been pulling a few here and there, but the big harvest will be here in a couple of weeks. I think you're right on that. Yeah, they're usually probably, I mean, edible, but, uh, but you get a lot less for your effort uh, right now. <laughs> for sure. So going back to you, Molly, uh, we've got a good question here. Um, so this this will really be more for next year, um, maybe in the fall even. So when starting seeds indoors, so say I start tomatoes in small pots, should I repot uh, waiting for warmer weather if they uh, if they outgrow the pot? Um, yeah. So if say if you seeded your tomatoes in January um, or like early February, then it would have been beneficial to up-pot them, as I call it. So basically once a tomato has their true leaves, so the first leaves that come out are the baby leaves or the cotyledons, and then the the next set will be their first set of true leaves. That is when they can be up pot into a more nutrient rich soil, uh, soil that has a little bit more porosity to allow for good air and oxygen flow. Um, And that is when I would recommend doing that because you don't wanna put out your tomatoes too early. Um, So especially, you know, in February, we could still definitely get a freeze Right. Um, but so it gives them a little more time to get up. They have adventitious roots, so you can plant them a little bit deeper. Um, and then, you know, around this time is when you'd want to put them outdoors. So if you, if you planted them late, say you planted them in, maybe you seeded them in say February or early March, then you might want to skip the up pot phase and go right into the garden. Just make sure that you watch out for cutworms because when they're real small, that's when they're, they can Oh my goodness. Those are awful. <laughs> they are they get me every day they ruined my day last year with the watermelons uh-huh <laughs> that was terrible oh man all right good good deal so good good advice there josh we've got a two-part question here for you we got a uh, we have quite a few listeners from time to time that aren't from the panhandle you know from different states the upper south we even had gentlemen from pakistan last month uh so the first part of this question i'd like you to get her what are the soils like in the panhandle generally for gardening and just kind of their characteristics and then second um, should we be testing our soil before uh, before we decide to put a garden in? Yeah, I mean, so we have exceptionally variable soils across the Panhandle. I mean, depending on where you, we got exceptional very exceptionally variable soils within most of our counties. Um, yeah. You know, two or three miles difference can can make a huge uh, huge impact on whether we got a, a really deep well drained sand or move into like a sandy loam or even a sandy clay loam or something like that that tends to be a little more red and certainly holds a lot more water it's not necessarily a, a right or a wrong for any of it i mean it all be all you know some some crops like we talked about carrots carrots really love a deep sand that's how you get a really long a really long straight carrot um right but they can grow in anything uh but you know as far as testing i would really like to see people test in the fall um as far as to get, find out where they're at nutrient wise. And if they need to apply some lime, they apply it in the fall, let that lime react. So by the time you're ready to go in the spring, 
your lime has reacted, your gypsum has reacted, and you've got that stuff available. You could lime anytime, but uh, we really want it to be lime like in the fall or sometime in the winter right. where our limes already reacted and got our pH to where we want it when we plant it. But I mean, certainly soil test, but don't let, you know, on, unless you get your soil test back and you're in like pH of like 4.6 or something, yeah. don't let it discourage you from, from growing a garden. It just tends to make nutrient management a bit more complicated. Right. That's a good answer. Yeah. So if you're not from the panhandle and you think Florida is all sand, it's not the case here in the panhandle. We have a lot of variability. Really do. Um, so Sheila, this is a, another kind of getting the garden started question. Um, you know, I'm a big raised bed gardener. I kind of gave up growing in the ground because, uh, you know, it's not ideal for some of the vegetables that I want to grow at my house. Um, but this is a, a gardener that wants to grow in the ground. So when would you uh, recommend that these folks uh, break their ground and get started or should that have already been done for this year? What do well, you think? I, ideally, if this is a new area that you are beginning to install vegetables, you, you haven't had them there before. Uh, right. Yeah, ideally, you did a soil test back in the fall. You know what you're deficient in. And uh, 100, 120 days ago, yeah, two, three months ago, <laughs> you started to till up that, add the good organic materials to it if you've got your own compost, um, and then do the corrections on your pH because, unfortunately, that's going to take time. And in order to have it ready for being able to plant at the end of this month, um, you need to start thinking about doing that stuff in January. Uh, is it too late? No, it's not too late. You can still do that, but now you will have to add these things uh, and you won't get the response as quickly. So look at the later season. Look at the tomatoes that like it a little bit hotter, the peppers that like it a little bit hotter. Don't get the early season vegetables. Get those that develop a little bit later or have the longer season uh, of growth to mature because it's going to take your soil a little while to adjust. Fair enough. So ideally, yes, too late. In a, you know, in the world you may inhabit, you know, do it when you can and, and do the best you can. So, um, Josh, kind now, of you have that solution that you came up with that raised garden will warm up and yeah. then you can introduce the soils that you want. Yep. I can control the soil how I want it. And along those lines, Josh, let's get into that. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest these these days in raised beds, but could you just talk to kind of like what are the advantages, disadvantages versus from raised bed versus sort of in the ground gardening? I mean, I know across the state, across the country, the vast majority of vegetables are grown in the ground. But for a home gardener, uh, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I like the I like the phrase of, uh, you know, you got to bake with the flour you got. And so, um Yep. Yeah, just a, you need to look in, into your environment and see what it's suitable for. If you've got a, a large yard that's got good sunshine um, and, you know, any type of substrate in the form of soil, then you should be able to grow in it. Um, so I, to me, if you've got, if, you know, you want it to be well drained. If it's if you got an area that you had planned for your garden and it holds water consistently after it rains, that's probably not ideal because that tends to to create a greater issue with fungal diseases. Um, so if you've got a well-drained spot that's in the sun, then by all means use it. If you don't, then, you know, maybe that's, uh, maybe the time to move to like a raised, a raised bed type system. The reason I like, um, I like growing in the ground is because it gives you a little better, what we call buffer capacity with irrigation. I mean, you can grow a tomato in a, in a quart pot all season long. Uh, <laughs> and that's perfect. I mean, you can do that. It's, yeah. I mean, Anybody's ever been to Epcot, you can grow it without soil. Soil's an un yep. unnecessary substrate, but uh, sure. but it just takes a lot more intensity of management. So the smaller the the receptacle you're growing it in, whether it's a small bed or whatever else, you may have to water more frequently, stuff like that. So I think you've uh, it can be done either way. Don't be discouraged either way, but just know you know with a raised bed type system, you may have to manage it a little more intensively. You may not. Um, so I, I think it's uh, it's really the, the situation that each gardener's in and what they've got to work with. And if they got a decent yard or, or farm or whatever else, then, you know, maybe it's easier just to, to grow in the ground. Gotcha. Good deal. Yeah, I grow some some tomatoes in the big in big black nursery containers. And I know in the heat of the summer when they've got a full root system, that's a multiple times per day watering operation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's, it's not ideal. <laughs> but all right, so going back to Sheila, uh, so with those raised beds, um, let's, let's say our, our gar hypothetical gardener here is choosing to go the raised bed or container route. What, in your opinion, is a good, or they ask the best, but a good affordable planting mix for tomatoes and other vegetables? Um, well, if you're doing the smaller containers, like you mentioned, the nursery pots, um, you know, those, those special pots uh, for patio and that sort of thing, you definitely need a soil-less mix. Keep in mind, soil means there is composted material in it. And that could lead to fungal or gnat problems. So in small containers, you want to look at something soilless. It'll still have peat moss. It'll probably have some uh, minerals like the vermiculite or perlite in it. Um, it. May even have a little bit of some crushed pine bark type products or quar, the coconut hulls, to help you with some of the, the management on water. Um, but in small container, it needs to be soilless. That's going to get really expensive when you start getting into a raised garden. So when you start looking at raised gardens, you may have to blend with some other composted materials. What I want you to avoid is the El Cheapo garden and topsoil because there's absolutely no consistency in what's in those bags. Um, brands that are out there, you know, if your pocketbook really affords it, Pro Mix is pretty hard to beat, but it's expensive. So yeah. what you're going to see in the big box stores is probably going to be in the miracle Grow line. And they do make a potting media or potting mix. Does not have the word soil on it. Right. They also have a raised bed blend that will have a little bit of composted material in it, but it's been heat treated so that you don't have to deal with those insect eggs and those fungus spores. Um, in some of the independent nurseries and whatnot, you will see the Happy Frog uh, brand that they also have some active mycorrhizae and additional uh, soil um, micronutrients um, in them. So there are other options uh, of course, you know, the more elaborate it is, the more expensive it is. But the Miracle Grower, the Happy Frog line is pretty affordable for most people. Okay. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on um, like bulk compost? Not for straight into the raised bed by itself. Gotcha. It would have to be blended with some sand sure. um, in order to improve your drainage. And that sand now needs to be clean. So it's not digging it up from your yard. It, it needs to be builder or mason sand so that it is clean. Um, depending on how heavy the compost is, if it is straight mushroom compost, then you're dealing with a higher pH. You may also want to add some crushed pine bark. And that's hard and harder to find in bulk. You yeah, may is. have to buy some bags of what they call soil conditioner or actually take your mini nuggets of pine bark mulch and actually beat them up. Run them over with the truck. <laughs> That's, that is a way and, to do and it. Incorporate them in. <laughs> okay. 10 four. Uh, Matt, we've got a bunch of questions um, over the last few days about fertilizing. And so basically um, what I'd like for you to hit here is, you know, kind of what fertilizer we should be using, um, you know, and then when, how often, uh, if you could touch on that for the spring garden, it'd be awesome. Okay, um, so just a, a general recommendation would be uh, one to three pounds um, of fertilizer per 100 square feet. Um, now that's gonna vary depending on your, your grade. So if it's a triple six, and we'd want something that was, it was a balanced fertilizer. Um, right. Unless you're going out and getting the soil test, you might see that you, you don't need all the phosphorus um, that's on some of those products. But um, if it's like a triple six, so it's got, you know, a lot of extra rocks in it and not as much yeah. actual nutrients in it, um, then you're going to be more on the heavy side, uh, closer to three pounds per um, 100 square feet. Sure. Um, if it's triple 15, then you might just be uh, one and a half, two pounds, something like that. And generally, you'd want to apply about half of, of that recommendation. 
um, at planting. So if you're doing transplants or um, when seeds uh, start to germinate, if you, if you started with seed. And then um, the other half would be um, around right before things start to flower. Um, but it's all gonna vary depending on what you're growing. So some of your root crops are gonna need more uh, potash or potassium. That would be another name for that. Um, and then like your leafy greens or cabbage, um, some of your leaf crops are going to need a lot more nitrogen because you're growing those leaves. You yeah, for sure. Flowers. Um, the, the, you, you have done a lot of research with um, slow release or controlled release products for vegetables um, over the last few years. Um, still, still looking into that, but, you know, once they get some good recommendations for vegetable growers, then we can, we can get some good recommendations for, for home gardeners. All right. So Josh, a problem a lot of folks have uh, in the garden, and I know uh, for a commercial guy, you know, you might just inject some tail on or something like that, but for a home gardener, how are we going to manage nematodes if we have that problem? And, and maybe address, how do you know if you have a nematode problem? Uh, I mean, so the most common nematode that that home gardeners would uh, would encounter would be root knot nematode, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, usually, you'll see um, chlorosis or yellowing of, of the foliage. Sometimes it might be spotty, depending on how big your garden spot is. But uh, you kind of have to sacrifice whatever it is you're growing to figure it out. So yeah. I mean, they they call it root knot nematode for a reason. So you pull it up and you can see the you can see what we call galls. And so the roots kind of form these very large or can be very large beads, maybe the size of a marble. And so the roots kind of they're not very fibrous. You don't see many roots. You see these things that almost look like a like a deformed parsnip under the soil. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's a that's a, a telltale indicator you've got root knot nematode. And they're hard to get rid of uh, specifically because root knot has a huge host range. And so yeah. most of our warm season vegetables, root knot will infest uh, some cool season veg vegetables, but most of our warm season stuff. So um, you can look at alternative planting, alternative plantings uh, like marigold. Uh, you can use some of the brassicas. So any brassica that you, that you taste that's spicy, uh, like some of our mustards, they have yeah. what they call glucosinolates in them. So you grow them, sacrifice them, till them into your garden. That's a long-term solution to uh, the, you know, to nematode control. Okay. Otherwise, movement and rotation. I mean, if you yeah. have limited limited sites, then then rotate in to something that is not a host. Uh, again, a lot most of our brassicas are not hosts for uh, for nematodes. Our cool season crops. So you may just have to move. I mean, that's a bad, uh, a bad answer, but for the home gardener, uh, nematode <laughs> yeah. management is a lot more challenging uh, than it is for commercial growers. Just there's no nematicides available. Right. Can you move into a raised bed? Would that help potentially? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Put a, put down some, uh, like some, a plastic barrier because nematodes migrate. Uh, they can, we know root knot nematode can migrate about two inches a day. So a tiny microscopic roundworm, can easily move two inches a day. And so if you don't have a barrier or something, they can, uh, they're what we call chemotaxic. So they can, they can sense those root exudates that you're rinsing through your garden and into the ground and they can work their way right up through a film of water into your garden. So put a plastic barrier. If you know you've got a nematode issue, put a plastic barrier under the bottom of your garden. It may create some drainage, could create some drainage issues, but it'll also kind of slow the, the migration of root knot nematode as well. Yeah, that's absolutely a great point because I've uh, I did not put a barrier under my garden and I um, noticed um, I was was with okra of course a magnet for root knot you know absolutely. and uh, by the end of the year the, my plants were declining pulled them up and there was just galls all over the place so good good <laughs> good info by Josh there for sure Matt Lawler wake up over there let's get to you. Uh, okay. We've got a question from a couple of clients here. Uh, the first one, they're they're both about container gardening, but one is about uh, an earth box, which I have no, I know nothing about. So hopefully you're going to shed some light on earth, what an earth box is and how to grow in that. And the other one is, do you have any experience with these newer self-wicking containers? So like maybe self-watering containers? Is that, what, I think maybe that's what they're mentioning. So yeah, that, that, that's the way I took that one. And I, I mean, both of them would be similar as far as the way the plants take up the water. The, the earth box has a, a little tube that you water into, um, and then it's a covered box. 
uh, so that you can kind of eliminate or not eliminate, but try to control some of the, the weed issues that might appear even in a container garden. Um, I talked to a couple people just with some observational uh, analysis of earth boxes and, and what kind of media. Um, so it's similar to what Sheila hit on with the raised bed gardens. You know, the majority of that mix is going to be some sort of potting media or potting mix. Um, and, and they did uh, say that they had some benefits from putting a little bit of like a manure product like black cow um, and then uh, some chicken litter, but just a tad of chicken litter in, in that mix um, just, to, just to provide some fertilizer. I, I think they were going more of a, I won't call it strictly organic, but more of an organic route with those boxes. Uh, the, the self wicking would be similar as far as the, the, the way the plants take up the water, but I, I think on those, or I think what this person is asking is, you know, you're hooking a garden hose up to that. And, you know, as, as that box fills, um, you know, closer to, to saturated soil, then, then it kind of, that valve shuts off the water until, until the plants need water again. Okay, that sounds like a pretty interesting concept. But uh, you definitely need something. And for some reason, I lost video there for a minute. But uh, you definitely need something that um, could drain well, uh, especially since you've got that that water sitting in that tray um, at the the bottom of those plants. Yeah. Some yeah, that's a good good consideration there for that one. All right, so we've covered kind of getting started in the garden, fertilizing soil, some other things. We're going to move into you know, the king or, or queen, what have you, of, uh, of Florida garden vegetables, the tomato. You know, a vast majority of our questions every year um, are on tomatoes. And so, Josh, over there, in, over there in Quincy, you know, historically, we've had a big tomato industry, so we're going to get started with you. Um, and this is a very common question. Uh, so what tomato varieties would you recommend for beginning gardeners? So for the, the less experienced, I would try to find a variety that has the the best disease resistance package you can get. Um, there's a couple, I would say modern, modern-ish, certainly more modern varieties. Um, I like to see everybody grow something that's got tomato spotted wilt virus resistance. That tends to be a, a problem in our area. So there's a couple, uh, a couple varieties, uh, BHN 1021, uh, BHN 589 is a, is a pretty decent flavor variety. It doesn't have spotted wilt resistance, uh, Mountain Fresh Plus, Mountain Merit. Um, any of those are pretty decent flavor. So the tomatoes get a bad rap. Uh, they're, they're not super flavorful. Uh, and some of it for good reason, some not. Um, so, yeah, I would try to find something that is more disease resistant, more of a modern hybrid you know, you're, you're setting yourself up for a little, a better chance. I mean, tomatoes are hard to grow, period. Um, that's all there is to it. It's the, it's the yeah. single vegetable that everybody wants to grow and they pick the hardest one right out of the gate. Yeah, definitely the highest degree of difficulty for a home gardener, I feel. Absolutely. And while we're on that, is there a variety that you might, you know, a couple of older or more common varieties that you might get people to, to stay away from just because of, you know, lower disease package or something? Uh, yeah, I mean, everybody loves, uh, there's probably a handful of heirlooms that everybody wants to grow, Cherokee Purple. Yeah. That one always comes up on the list. Um, and it's just any any of the heirlooms are harder to grow. Um, and the one thing I would tell people, like I see home gardeners all the time, like they'll, they'll make the mistake of, and it's with peppers too. Like with an heirloom, they want it to get full table ripe on the vine. And every day it's at, you know, beyond a breaker stage. So if you look at the blossom end or the bottom end of that tomato, once it goes through color change, you're safe to pick it off. Like it, tomatoes are what we call climacteric. So they're going to continue to ripen on your yep. windowsill. And you got a much better chance of a bird not sticking its beak in there, <laughs> yeah. a stink bug not piercing it, a fruit worm not digging in the side of it. So once we see breaker stage fruit, go ahead and pull them off, bring them inside, put them on the windowsill, let them get the table ripe. And they're going to stand less chance. I mean, I've grown Cherokee purple before. And if you look at a, Cher a ripe Cherokee purple wrong, it's going to bruise. Uh, yeah. That's just the nature of it. And so... You better take it off the plant, go inside, slice it, and put it on a sandwich and be done with it. So 
uh, the heirloom varieties, if you choose to grow them, they're going to be a bit more difficult. But you know, don't let them don't let them go to table ripe on the vine because they they just they bruise really easy and they're harder to grow. They're all going to split and crack. You get a rain on a brandy wine or Cherokee purple or you know Arkansas traveler or something like that, and they're going to split wide open if they're anywhere close to table ripe on the vine. Gotcha. So go ahead and pick those when they get to that stage. That's good. Molly, another question that we get all the time, that several listeners asked. Um, so we should we grow tomatoes in the ground or in pots? And I have a feeling it's going to be an it depends answer. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could grow tomatoes in either. Sometimes it can be easier to grow them in containers, uh, taking into account all of the, the different aspects that Sheila mentioned about the different kind of potting medium you should use. Um, one nice thing about tomatoes grown in containers is if you could, if you get a determinate variety, so they, they kind of like us, they quit growing. They can be a little bit easier to manage, um, you know, in a con container setting and all the fruit kind of comes on at once. Uh, the big thing is just to make sure you have enough space. So you don't, you don't want to pack in a whole bunch of tomatoes into a smaller container. Um, I like to say at least three to five gallons per tomato to make sure that they can grow to maturity. And then of course, you'll still also want to use a stake or, or a cage, which I would recommend going ahead and putting that in the container ahead of time. You know, you don't want to wait too late where all the, the roots are starting to become established in the pot. Um, but and yeah, you can grow just about any tomato you'd like in a container pretty easily. Um, and then that can help too with if, you, if you're trying to, if you love tomatoes, you don't want to grow them in the same spot year after year. Because uh, they can, you can have a lot of soil diseases that way. An alternative is to go ahead and stick them in a container. Awesome. That's that's kind of the, the way I do it. Just a, a little bit of both, depending on what I've got going on. So, Josh, going back to tomato selection here. So we've got a couple of questions. Again, several people ask these, uh, and we can we'll kind of combine these. Is there a tomato variety in your opinion? I know you touched on this a second ago, but maybe just kind of highlight it again. That's disease resistant, but still tastes good. And then, in your opinion, um, what's the best slicing tomato choice that we can grow here in the Panhandle? As a homeowner, um, what was the first part? The yeah, the, the disease, disease resistant and still tastes good. So yeah, the reason why most of our tomatoes get an exceptionally bad rap um, is because of the way, you know, I tell people all the time, consumers made a grand compromise about 30 years ago that they, you know, the folks that lived in the northern tier of the U.S. wanted a fresh tomato in January, so that was yeah. the grand compromise that we grow tomatoes in Florida and we pick them at a green stage and we box them and we induce ripening so we can ship them all over the world if we needed to. But uh, a lot of times those tomatoes are underripe and they'll still turn red, but they don't develop the volatiles, the flavors that they would if they were at least vine, vine ripe. And when I say vine ripe, I don't mean blood red, table ready on a vine. As long as they, you know, start to break color on a vine, your flavor is going to develop fine. So, there's a lot of varieties, even our, many of our commercial varieties that we grow that have the, you know, the best disease resist, resistance package we can get are still pretty, pretty good on a, you know, on a piece of, uh, on a piece of loaf bread with some mayonnaise, if we let them go to table right on the vine. So, you know, even if you were to get, you know, a, a brand new variety, Red Snapper, Grand Marshall, whatever it is, and grow it at your home, you let it go to table ripe, it's still going to have pretty decent flavor. Were those varieties bred for flavor? No, probably not, but they're, uh, they're pretty close. Amelia is a pretty good one. That's got some, uh, got a decent package resist disease resistant package. It's still got a pretty good flavor. A lot of the mountain varieties, they're not the most adapted. And I say mountain, it's mountain, fresh plus mountain, right. Merit, mountain magic, yada, yada, yada. Those are all bred at North Carolina state. They do fairly well in the panhandle. Pick your disease resistance package. And there's some of those that even have nematode resistance. So if you got nematodes in your in your home garden, it's not a deal breaker. And you know, I don't necessarily advocate for sources, but there's uh there's a company called Totally Tomatoes, and then Johnny's uh Johnny's selected seeds where home home gardeners can get small quantities. I mean, we yeah. we deal with commercial commercial grow or commercial sellers that you know you got to get a hundred or a thousand or five thousand. But at least those those uh, retailers have smaller seed seed quantities you can order, and I would say more advanced varieties. Okay, yeah, that's. I, I feel like, like you said, tomatoes get a you know an undeserved, necessarily bad rap for you know they just don't taste like they used to. You hear that all the time, and it's not necessarily yeah. the case. It's how they're treated, you know. So right, exactly. 
Okay, good deal. I'm glad you cleared up that myth, did a little myth busting for us. Matt Lawler, while we're on the tomato selection topic, what do you think about uh, if, if a homeowner wants to grow tomatoes and make tomato sauce? What You got a, any recommendations for the panhandle? Well, I avoid growing tomatoes altogether, but <laughs> I hear you. Uh, gen- generally people are going to grow like a Roma or a plum type tomato for, for sauce. Um, they got less seeds and they've they got more meat for, for breaking down for, for sauce. Um, so we've got a list that Mary put up on our chat, um, but we've got uh, BHN 685, uh, Daytona, Mariana, Picus, Supremo, and Tachi are um, some of the recommended varieties for Florida. Um, all of those um, have a broad spectrum of disease resistance, um, except for Daytona is a little bit lacking on um, some of the different diseases there. Um, just another note with, with canning, um, I have spoken with some people um, and they like to, as soon as they pick those uh, Roma tomatoes or something that they're gonna break down in the sauce, they throw them the whole tomato in a bag in the freezer. Um, and then when they pull it out, um, the skin's already pretty much broken down. They can just slide that skin off um, and then they can boil it down and, and make it into sauce. It's a little simpler yeah. than having to slice around the tomato, um, just to slice the skin and then boil it down and then peel the skins off or however other ways people might do that. <clears throat> gotcha. Awesome. So we hadn't really touched on these varieties, Sheila, but um, I've had good success with these and lots of folks tend to. What are your recommendations on um, patio sized cherry tomatoes and in, in your experience, do these impact in part good disease resistance? Um, and you definitely, if you're a novice to tomatoes, that's a good starting point for you. Because yeah, most of them are a little more disease resistant. They're, they're fairly quick producers, um, not prone to as many of the problems that you deal with you know, as the, uh, Josh had mentioned with the splitting of the fruit and whatnot. So, and you can do them in small containers, including hanging baskets. Um, so yes, look at those varieties. Now, when you say patio, patio is actually a small fruit. It's not really a cherry tomato. Mm-hmm. And Matt mentioned the plums and the aromas. They're good ones to, to try to grow, but again, they're not the true cherries. So okay. when you start looking at the little bitty ones, okay, Sweet 100s are pretty hard to beat. Um, They've been a good standby for a long time. But some of the others, uh, you've seen the grape tomatoes on the market. And it's a little bit bigger, not too tough to grow. Uh, Juliet's a a little bit newer variety. And folks have pretty good success with that. But yeah, if if, if you haven't tried tomatoes before, that's a good start. Start with some of those cherries and see what kind of success you have. Um, But again, looking at tags for the disease resistance, they are all marked for uh, their tolerance to nematodes and the various diseases. So the more letters you got, the better off you're doing, right? (laughs) That's right. We want that whole alphabet up there. So Molly, a question that came in for you on our our Q&A here uh, from a Zoom participant. This this lady, Miss Ortega, has uh, cherry tomato plants from last spring that are still producing because I rolled the raised bed into my closed porch on cold days. Basically, she overwintered it on our porch. Is it okay to pull them out and start over with that tomato um, or just fertilize them where they are and keep go and let them keep going? What would you do there? Uh, so they're in a closed area, but they have sunlight, I take it. Yeah, yeah so it, sh- should she pull them out and start over with new tomatoes this year? Or can she keep that same plant going? I think. Oh, I see. Pull them out. Um, yeah, I mean, I would probably pull them out and start over, you know, they're not going to have as good as production at this point. Um, that's, that's, that's cool that you got it through the cold winter. I couldn't have done that. I don't think, especially making sure they had enough sunlight. Um, but I would probably pull them out and start over to get better production. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Matt, you mentioned earlier, we talked, we'll just, we'll get this one quick here about, you talked about earth boxes. Would you recommend using, reusing that potting medium each year? Um, or, or should you start over with fresh soil in a, in a box like that? Um, ideally, I would, I would start with some kind of fresh media um, or at yeah. least incorporate something fresh and, and maybe save, you know, half of the, the old stuff. But it's going to break down and uh, you're going to run into some drainage issues, especially with something where you're constantly putting water to it. Yeah. And you may have, I, can you overwinter diseases in a raised, in raised bed soil? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah. I would any, think so. any soil is gonna gonna attract something over over time. So definitely yeah. try 
rotate your crop, if anything. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. All right, Sheila, we've got, we'll, we'll go in a little bit different direction, but stay with tomatoes. Um, we've got several questions. So this is about companion planting. So um, what are some of your, would you recommend good companion plants for tomatoes? And then a second question, um, can you grow two different vegetables closely together in the same area? The example this lady gives are sweet potatoes underground and corn above ground. So hit the companion plantings and then maybe hit that specific example. And the, the companion planting as well as the growing things together is, has been done for thousands of years, not just by us recently. Companion planting can certainly assist you with attracting pollinators if your companions are flowers, um, as well as repelling harmful insects if you start incorporating herbs. So, you know, with tomatoes, some of the top choices for flowers are nasturtium, uh, bee balm, monarda, and the calendulas or other members of the marigold family. Um, so look at those as options. They certainly will enhance the flavor of the tomato in that you are getting the cross pollination between the flowers and the vegetable crop, which, you know, tomatoes are still a fruit. And so they, there's a lot of uh, research that's been done on that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an EDIS publication. So what you see uh, in the chat now is from the Almanac, the command, companion planning, but it spells out a lot of those options. Okay. Um, if you think about things like parsley, basil, and chives, and how strong their scent is, you can see why they would be very helpful in repelling some of the harmful insects also. So those would be the top choices in companion planting uh, for flowers or herbs within your tomatoes. Uh, if you go to the publication, you'll see that there's other matches for other uh, crops also. So um, check that out and see which your top choices are. Now, as far as growing together, yeah, yeah that's what uh, Indians did forever, right? You grow okay. your beans up your corn stalk and you put your other edge season type things like your leafy crops or your squashes at the base of it. The issue is going to be orientation to sunlight. Make sure that that tall plant is not shading out the others. So if you've okay. got that option to run a true north-south vegetable garden so that the tall items in the middle and the sunlight can hit from both sides, that's great. Otherwise, you may have to orientate all your tall items on the south end of your garden. Okay. But yeah, you can certainly share space by growing a vine up the tall ones and doing a broad spreading leafy one below it. Gotcha. Good deal. Uh, so we're going to hang out in tomatoes for just a few more minutes, and then we're going to move on and finish up with some some pest management and a few miscellaneous questions. Josh, this is a quick question that came in earlier today. Uh, you just hit on it real quick. So for a homeowner, um, how often should I water my tomatoes? So should it be like a um, on a schedule or just when it wilts? What's your, what would your recommendation be? Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on what they're growing it in. I mean, there's sure. been several questions about, um, about growing tomatoes in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a raised bed or a container yeah. or something like that. And tomatoes are super finicky uh, in containers like that. So I'm sure everybody has seen uh, blossom end rot in a tomato. Some people have, you know, their tomato crop has probably been, you know, completely uh, decimated by blossom end rot and they hadn't eaten anything. So blossom end rot is a calcium deficiency, but it's almost always caused as a, you know, as a result of infrequent watering. Um, you know, so anytime you see a tomato wilt, if it's got fruit on it, there's a fine chance you're going to have blossom end rot in about 10 days. Yeah. Uh, and so the event that caused the blossom end rot was, you know, days to weeks before you see it manifest in the bottom of a fruit. So that's the only thing, you know, you know, we in our soil systems outside in, you know, under plastic cover, we water up to three times a day. Um, gotcha. You know, I just I don't I want. So if you can picture like a graph of your water, you want it to be very smooth. You don't want these high peaks and valleys because the valleys of dry period, you may not see incipient wilting, 
But if those plants stop taking up water, they stop taking up calcium, and it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, gap in that calcium uptake to end up with blossom end rot. So you always want to keep the soil moist. If that means you got to water three times a day, then then that's what that's what it takes. But the larger reservoir that that you allow those roots to pull water from, I would say the less frequent you have to water them. But you know, in general, for a home gardener. Uh, you know, once they get fruit on there, the small fruit, I would say you yeah. probably need to water every day. Yeah, for sure. If not multiple times a day. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and if you're like somewhere south of I-10 and you're on a, on a deep well drained sand, yeah, multiple times a day. If you're, you know, fortunate to have a little heavier sandy loam, sandy clay loam soil, probably get away with once a day, once every other day, something like that. So, I mean, it's, okay. I know it's a super cagey answer and doesn't really answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. Yet but you have to, you got to do it based on what you're, what you're growing in. Yeah. Good deal. Matt Lawler, final question about tomatoes today. Um, is it possible? Can you really graft a tomato onto potato rootstock? Okay. Uh, so potatoes. And, and should you? Are in the, the, the same family. Yeah. Um, I, I looked it up and I guess it's called a pomato. <laughs> <laughs> and a tomato grafted together. Okay. Should you do it? No, but yes. <laughs> yes. You know, that's, that's the simple answer. But, but think about when we, when we grow potatoes versus when we grow tomatoes, um, you, you're starting potatoes in the winter. Uh, if you put your tomatoes out there at the same time, or if you've got a tomato top grafted onto that potato, that, that tomato is going to get frozen back. Um, so um, that would probably be the, the main reason not to do it. Uh, other reasons, uh, <laughs> I think you're better off just planting them next to each other <laughs> yeah. um, and letting them go. Um, okay. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, it's a possibility though. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And uh, we did put a, a thing in there about vegetable grafting because uh, uh, they do a lot of vegetable grafting with uh, some of the cucurbit crops, um, mm -hmm. and times with tomatoes. Okay. All right. So we're going to we're transition from specifically tomatoes back to kind of general gardening and do some pest management. So Josh, got a question for you, very common. I want you to answer this one from, from kind of a high level. Maybe what, what would your short list be of a couple of really important things home gardeners can do uh, for pest management? From a, the biggest from, from thing- like What would do. be the keys to, to a home gardener achieving a good pest management program in your mind? So the first, the first thing for disease management is quit putting water on your plant's leaves. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's not where they need to need to access their water. So, and leaf wetness, leaf wetness over duration is, is probably our number one cause of, of disease, whether it's fungal or bacterial on plant leaves. So first thing you can do is take the sprinkler off the garden. And I don't care if you put a soaker hose, drip tape, whatever it is, mm -hmm. water the roots and not the leaves. So yeah. that's number one. Um, okay. From a, from a disease management standpoint, that's the, the best thing you could do. From an insect management standpoint, it's just scouting. Uh, and by scouting, I mean, just look around. I mean, if you're diligent and look around, most insects, I mean, it's not like you've got 6,000 tomato plants to look at. If you've got five tomato plants, go out and look at them every day. And you're going to catch the horn worm when he's small before he eats a third of the foliage. Or you're going to catch the fruit worm while they're still feeding on the leaves before they make it into the fruit. Are you going to catch the stink bug before they start piercing everything? So yeah. that's probably the easiest thing from an insect management standpoint is scouting. Uh, I agree. Scouting and, and just picking them off. I mean, you know, you don't have a hundred acres to go through. So you just take a, you know, look at your plants on a regular basis. And, and if you got an insect on there, you know, bring it off or take it off and, and squish it. You know, you may pull a beneficial off every once in a while, but, uh, but until and there's, I'm sure there's a, a, an Edis pub for beneficial insects. And we've got a few beneficial stink bugs, beneficial lace wings, ladybird beetles, stuff like that, that are going to feed on aphids. So, you know, school yourself in what are beneficial inf insects that you want there. And then everything that doesn't fall into that list, pick them off and, and squish them on the ground. I hear you. Good, good tips. Matt Lawler, uh, kind of on these lines, we get a lot of questions uh, about leaf-footed bugs and, and stink bugs and things in that group. Uh, what's the best way in your mind to prevent or treat for that, uh, you know, other than, than scouting there and even scouting? And is there a companion plant that you would recommend to help take that attention away? Okay. Uh, so, so Josh hit on scouting really well. Um, as far as, you know, I, would, I guess you could call it an anti-companion plant or uh, trap crop, um, 
Hey, yeah. that works. Sunflowers sure. for leaf-footed bugs. They're, they're attracted uh, to sunflowers. Um, the thing is you'd want those sunflowers planted quite a distance from your vegetable garden uh, because you don't want them moving to the sunflowers and then moving on uh, to your, your crop. Um, so put it on the, the windward side if possible. Um, that's most likely where the leaf-footed bugs are going to be. They're, just gonna, they're lazy. They're coming in on, on the wind. Um, and uh, once you notice them, a good population on those sunflowers, you need to destroy them somehow. So you could pick them off, squash them. Um, you can vacuum them with one of those leaf vacuum things. Um, or if you're all right with spraying, um, you can spray them with uh, something that's going to knock them down. Um, and, and just kill them that way and then destroy that sunflower crop and you at least control some of them that way. Yeah. And uh, Julie asked me to mention that we're going to focus on predatory insects on July 29th uh, in oh, okay. the edition of Guarding the Pan Alive. So if you're interested in, you know, what the beneficials are that are out there, be sure to tune into that one in July. But until then, this, these are good answers. Matt, while we're with you, what's a good resource for knowing about controlling pests in our garden, you know, as, as in soft methods, quote unquote organic? Okay, uh, so, so Mary's going to put up a link to uh, its natural products for landscape and, and garden. Yeah. Um, and it's got a complete list there. Um, you know, you've got your neem oils that you'll usually use for something like an aphid. Um, you've got your pyrethrums. So I know Sheila's talked about uh, plant, uh, companion planting and so has Josh um, using uh, uh, different chrysanthemums and things for nematodes, but uh, they also derive some oil from, uh, or sorry, excuse me, some natural pesticide from those chrysanthemums. You can get them, uh, they'll just, instead of pyrethroid or pyrethrin, I-N, they'll, they'll have U-M, so pyrethrum. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a number of BT products uh, for caterpillars, so like Dipel and Thuricide, um, but got to complete okay. there to help you out. Good deal. That's a good resource. Yeah, check that out in the chat. I see a couple of those things popping up. Uh, Molly, the, the infamous tomato pest, uh, maybe the most most famous anyway, if not the most common, what's the best natural way uh, to prevent tomato hornworms? And I think we might have already touched on it already. Yeah, we have. Um, I would I would say the first thing is what Josh said is to, yeah. to do a scouting. You know, if you're you're not a farmer, if you don't have acres and acres of tomatoes, uh, the best thing to do is get out there, turn over those leaves. You know, if you see any holes or any caterpillar poop, look look underneath, see if you can just grab that caterpillar, um, squash it. Uh, the other thing, let's say you you didn't get out there early enough, or you have a lot of tomatoes, and you can't turn over every leaf. Um, as Matt said, um, using the BT or Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a, it's a natural uh, bacteria that's commonly found in the soil, but it only affects the Lepidoptera species and it's targeted. They have to eat, they have to actually digest the BT. So you don't have to worry about like your pollinator plants um, and your monarch butterflies and that kind of thing. So you use like a Dipel um, or a Thuricide product. You, you follow the labeled instructions, go outside and be sure to cover up all of the both sides of the leaf because it's going to take that caterpillar actually digesting the product for it to work. You want to do gotcha. it in the evening. It breaks down um, very fast and then give it a few days and then you can keep going out and, and maybe every week um, make, seeing if it really has made a difference. But number one is scouting. Get out there. Yeah. Last year, that's how I took care of all of my caterpillar problems was just picking them off the leaves. Yep. Easy way to do it. Uh, Matt, so not only do we have uh, pest problems that are insects uh, and diseases, we've got weed issues. And so what in your mind is a good way to keep grassy weeds from between your, your vegetable plants? Okay, so I've uh, got a combination of methods. Uh, you could go with some different mulches, uh, like some pine straw, um, and just, you know, cover both the beds and the, the areas between um, your vegetable plants. Um, and then there's a, there's a number of different cultivation tools that you can purchase. Uh, you know, one is like a, a stirrup hoe that you could maybe use when the plants are a little bit uh, younger and then some little like finger type cultivators uh, that, that people like to use for, for controlling some of those grassy weeds. Um, the, the third option would be a, like a living mulch. Um, so you could get away with uh, planting, actually planting some grass to keep the, some of that other grass at bay. Um, if you do have some 
uh, weedy type grasses, but you could do a mixture of grass and clover. Um, and it's something that you could, you know, if you had a way to mow it or um, even go through with uh, the hoe and just break it down um, in the middle, you know, throughout the season. Um, and it'll also provide a little bit of nutrients back into your crop. Yeah, you know, I know it's not the most popular thing, but in a large in-ground garden, you know, spot spraying in between those plants with a herbicide is, is always a good option, too, as long as you, you read the label and pay attention, I think. You know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, especially if you've got a, a hood that you can put on your sprayer um, yeah. from hitting your uh, crops that you're growing um, and just, yeah, either spot spray or go down the, the middle of the rows. Gotcha. Okay. All right, Josh, our final question on this Um this client's plants frequently seem stunted. They don't die, but they don't grow and they don't see pests most of the time. Could this be a nutrient deficiency? And what steps would you recommend they take to try to diagnose the problem? I mean, so yeah, it could be nutrient, it could be nematode. Um, I mean, it sounds like a classic nematode, uh, nematode problem. If you yeah. got plants that are kind of stunted, they get a little yellowed up and, uh, and just don't move. Could be nematode. So sacrifice one, depending on what it is, pull it up, check the roots, see what they look like. Uh, I mean, the other thing is, uh, get in touch with your local extension agent and have a, you know, have a tissue analysis done. I don't know what our, our common ag labs cost, maybe 12, 15 bucks to get a tissue analysis done. It at least gets you an idea if you're in the, in the ballpark of being right. I mean, that's the only way to know. Yeah. I don't care how green or how yellow it is. Um, you can't you know, look and see chemicals, you know? Nah. No, and yeah. so you can, uh, and the other thing is, you know, we tell growers to do this all the time, take a paired soil and tissue analysis, and that shows you generally we'll have some imbalances, and so we'll have uh, growers that have a ton of potassium in the soil and not enough in the, in the tissue, and so commonly what we see is they've either overlimed and their pH is a little high, or they've put way too much gypsum on, and so their calcium is way out of whack, and so then their cations or, you know, calcium, ammonium, potassium, they get out of whack. So those are the like two or three steps you could go to, to figuring out. Soil test cheap, tissue test is pretty cheap in the scheme of things, but that's, yeah. the, only way to, that's the only way to know. Right. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, Sheila, we, we could have hit on this one earlier. I, I honestly forgot to put it in the, in the first section. Just a, a quick uh, yes or no. Is it too late to plant English peas? English peas were, were too warm, okay? Okay, so when they would you want to get them in? The, the 80s were in trouble. Uh, right. But you could still look at something like snow or snap peas. Okay. Those where you're going to eat the container that the bees come in. Um, those are still acceptable. So you, but you better hurry. So if we want to grow English peas quickly. next year, when would you get them in? Uh, the, you can do the, the late fall um, okay. and get a crop ready before we freeze, or you can play that little bit of winter game and put them in in January and know that you're going to have to cover a few nights. Okay. So, Good. But Good look enough. at, you know, and of course all your Southern peas you certainly can do, but for the yeah. true little green English ones, if you got to shell it a little late, if you're going to eat the entire husk on it, no problem at all. You can still you. do a few of those. Um, and those were another one. And when we talked about the growing things together, uh, with our school gardens, we, we did this a lot. We used the tomato cage as a growing structure for cucumbers and peas and beans and that sort of thing. So look at those options to maybe get a little shading from the tomato to grow that edge crop that might be a little bit late. So look gotcha. at those options. All right. Thank you. Matt, this is a little different. Um, how can we improve the heat of a hot pepper when we're growing it? Yeah, I thought that was a good question. That was very interesting. Um, so there's just a, like a general question and answer page that uh, we'll post from Texas A&M, but it's all about peppers. So I thought that might be interesting. It did not hit on the topic of increasing heat, though. Um, so the, I think the, the best way would be to neglect your peppers. Um, so any, any stress plant is going to produce more flavor in its fruit. It might produce less fruit, um, but it is going to produce more flavor. And the reason I say that is uh, there's a number of studies on organic uh, production where they, they compared yields um, to conventional crops. And then they also looked at the flavor of those organic crops versus the conventional. Um, now, even though their, their yields were, were lower with a lot of the crops, uh, they did have 
more of the uh, anthocyanin or, um, you know, a lot of the different uh, flavonoids that are in um, all sorts of different fruits and vegetables. Gotcha. So we're right on one o'clock here. If you have to run, we're, we're glad you joined us today and be sure to do our, hit our survey. Um, if you will, that'll be emailed to you. You can also find it there in the chat, but we've got three or four, maybe five more questions we're going to get to. So if we hadn't answered your question, we're going to try to get to it right here in the next few minutes if you want to stick on. If not, again, thanks for joining us and we'll see you in April. Um, but Molly, uh, the, again, this is a, kind of an off-season off answer uh, question here, but can we grow spinach in the panhandle? We can grow spinach in the panhandle. It can be a little bit difficult to grow. Um, a true spinach, I would definitely recommend starting in October or November. Um, it really yeah. does need cooler weather um, and it struggles to germinate in the heat. So, you know, if we have a really generally warm October, it might be better to wait a little longer. Um, but September, it can be too hot. Um, I would, you okay. could also try a New Zealand or Malabar um, species. It's not true spinach, but it kind of has a spinachy taste and they can take the heat. Um, so look into that. Um, some people like it, some people don't, but it's a great summer green. Okay. Josh, we've got a Facebook question for you from Russell Ron Fairbanks. His question is, what do I need to do to protect my new sweet corn from birds and raccoons? First time trying peaches and cream as well as Silver Queen. So some abi or not abiotic, but animal pests. How could we protect from that? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> deterrent methods. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, usually most of our, uh, our pests, they develop tolerance to our deterrent methods. I don't care if it's soap or human hair or, you know, capsicum sprays, anything like that. Noise machines, uh, generally most of those pests, within a week or so, develop a tolerance. Now, that may be long enough, uh, at least for crows. I mean, they tend to only, you know, mess with seedling stage stuff. So, yeah. once you get, like, two or three true leaves on it, generally they don't pull it up as much. So, you know, some something flashy that's moving around, maybe that'll work long enough to get you past the seedling stage where they won't pull it up. Deer, uh a big fence, you know, I mean, that's, that's the only, the only really true way to get rid of them. I mean, I've heard any number of things that work for a short amount of time, you know, even propane cannons that go off all the time, they will eventually develop a tolerance for it and walk right by. Um, and your neighbors are going to hate you. Oh yeah. You won't have any. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, they'll break the, they'll break the propane cannon too. So uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, you know, some, you know, something that creates motion uh, will get you by the, you know, get you through the seedling stage. And then hopefully that's long enough to where the crows will leave you alone. The crows and other birds are a problem in late season stuff. I mean, crows peck holes in watermelons, tomatoes, blah, blah, blah. blah. So uh, there's not a real great, easy solution to those other than to just get you into the season. Gotcha. I appreciate that answer. Matt, this is a, a little bit different topic also. Uh, my fig tree did not produce last year. Is it too late to prune it, trim it back at this point? What are your thoughts? Okay, uh, so generally I would try to avoid uh, pruning on figs unless it's, you know, branches that are crossing. Right. Or, um, you know, maybe yeah, figs don't ever really need a ton of pruning. I mean, they don't grow huge to start with, right? Right. And, um, you know, if you did have to, to prune, uh, the dormant season would be the best time. Um, if you did have some, some branches or some uh, sprouts that were just shooting up from the middle of the, the tree um, or the bush, uh, however you've got that formed, um, then you, can, you could always, you know, remove them throughout the year. Um, but I, I would avoid, I would just leave it alone um, because you are going to um, inhibit some of that fruit production by trimming it back this late. Okay. And Josh, we've, we've touched on this one a little bit before, but do you have any specific recommendations on, um, you know, somebody wants to kind of mix a vegetable and a flower garden together? Is that, is that something that you can do? And what are some combinations you've seen done? I mean, yeah, you can do it. Um, you know, we've had uh, several, several times we've heard people mention marigold. Uh, yeah. That's kind of the leaves. old wives tale thing, right? Right. Well, no, I mean, that's, that's, that's good science. I mean, marigold, that's a legit marigold, thing. Okay. yeah, marigold is, uh, is, is an absolute, uh, I mean, that's, that's proven it. Marigold works for, uh, okay. root exudates are, uh, I don't know, they're true to but they're, uh, certainly deterrents to, to okay. 
So, I mean, but you want to like balance competition and ground cover. I mean, if you had a good solid ground cover, any, any sunlight uh, that gets to the soil is going to stimulate weed growth. Uh, so if you've got something that you're using as a ground cover that's pre preventing sunlight to get to that soil, you know, you're going to keep weed seeds from germinating. So, I mean, that, I'll be honest, that's not, that's certainly not in my wheelhouse. Uh, <laughs> as far as what to grow, we usually use some type of ground cover to keep, uh, to keep moisture in and keep weeds kind of beat back. Um, so and I think there's some classic systems that use a, use a flower or, you know, like Sheila mentioned, using a, um, something that's, that's going to bring in pollinators as well as, uh, you know, we've got some work going on here that people are, um, our entomologist is looking at Bidens. I don't know that I suggest anybody planting Bidens in their Spanish garden. needles. Yeah. Oh exactly. my goodness. <laughs> uh, but you know, they're an attractant to some of our, uh, our insect pests, our beneficial insects. And so sure. we've got work looking at stuff like that, not necessarily interplanting, but, a but, a like an edge planting, uh, okay. to bring in some of our pests and parasitoids because the, a lot of our really, really good uh, beneficial insects are the ones we don't see. They're little parasitoid wasps that do mm -hmm. a lot of the a lot of our best work, and they need like nectar, uh, nectar and and pollen. Uh, you know, to that's their food source uh, at least for their for the adults. The mature the immatures are going to feed on whatever they're growing inside. But uh, yeah. So yeah, maybe maybe not Biden's in your garden, but maybe on the uh, on the edge if you wanted to take over the rest of your yard. Yeah, I already have plenty of those in my garden, so great. Yeah, yeah. maybe we can pass. I'm sure we can hook y'all up with some Biden seed if you need some. Yeah. But, hey, we, we're five, six minutes over, so we're going to go ahead and call it a day. We've, we've gotten through the vast majority of our questions. Uh, there's been a ton of good information put out there. I appreciate everybody who attended today. If those of you that are still on, thanks for hanging in there with us. We've, we've greatly appreciated it. We've enjoyed it. Um, you know, for Sheila, uh, Josh, Matt, Julie, Mary, um, Carrie Stevenson, and the, and the rest of the, the horticulture team crew here that puts on these Gardening in the Panhandle events, we thank you for being here, um, and we'll see you uh, in April. So hope, hope y'all have a great afternoon, and we'll see you next time.